Now, this is, a, this is a huge deal for me because we were sitting here like this 21 years ago when, we you, uh, when you asked me to do your first interview, TV interview, yeah. on a video yeah. backstage at Cardiff Castle yep. for Come Home and Feel the Noise. That's right. Oh, my God. And you've, Kelly, right. it's been tw- and it's been about 20, 19 years since I've seen you. It has been, yeah. And I, I, thought, I thought it was going to be mildly depressing seeing Kelly Jones with grey hair looking old and stuff. You still look. <laughs> I thought you were going to look like someone's yeah, dad. I, you still look like someone's kid. I am someone's dad. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. You, you're, you're a dad now. Yeah. My God. Yeah. Mate, so much water has gone under the bridge. Yeah. I, I'm, but that I'm, was a good time. That was, you, know, you, you championed us a lot back in MD, so we're still grateful for all that. All that MTV coverage and stuff back in the day was... That was the transition from us not being played in the radio to going into the second album and things happening for us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. That yeah. was it. You were playing pubs. Yeah. And, and then, li- then I, I ninety nine, feel- we were in arenas. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I, I felt as though you know, it just it just needed me to just Strike pull that, that that spark. To the yeah. the, the tinder box was dry. You yeah. know. Yeah, but how, how lovely and and obviously I followed your career and it's been heartwarming how incredibly well Thank you've you. done and. Um, please send Rich so I will, much, yeah. so much, I will. so much love from me. So uh, and and you know and we and we play you so much on the radio and yeah. I'm always like cracking gags about your your voice that can <laughs> gravel driveways from fifty paces and stuff. But you know, but I've not seen you through through you know the the, the meat of your career. I've not yeah. I've not got to congratulate you on Dakota. Yeah. I mean, what a song. Yeah, I know was, we're here to talk about I, this. No, I know it was it was it was you know that song. You know, worldwide, whatever you play, the reaction is ridiculous for me. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, just briefly, just tell me about like how that uh, how that came into being. What what was there a moment of inspiration? You know, what yeah. yeah it, I mean, we were we got to the fourth album. You got to go. Let's come back, which was where maybe tomorrow's on. And on that record, we'd we'd all had long hair and rugs and stuff and backing singers. <laughs> we kind of turned into the Grateful Dead and the Black Crows, and <laughs> and then um, we decided to just change it all up really. So we just cut all the hair off and you know changed the, what the band looked like and all that but but that song came in a little hotel room in Paris um, and then I finished it the lyrics when we were touring we were doing the last David Bowie tour reality in America and I was actually in South Dakota uh, a place called Vermilion mm. and the song was called Vermilion oh, and I recorded name. it and then we found out Slipknot were just about to release a song called Vermilion literally <laughs> like a two weeks before so all the hard drives that song is called Vermilion I'm funny and uh, we just, I said I don't know I'll just call it Dakota because that's where it was recorded, and, uh, and and that became what it was. But it was a three-hour recording. It was it was one of those ones. If I could bottle that, mate, I would you know do it every week. But it was just one of those things that just came out, and and, and one of those and ones that just, just when you saw it, the reaction the first time live, it was just incredible. Yeah, I was, and it was, it was it was our only number one single, but it was it was an incredible experience. Yeah. Yeah, God, I still, you know, I, when, when I'm camping at festivals, I'm always woken up by somebody playing that yeah. full blast. It's always, yeah. you know, it's family them, camping yeah. near me. Yeah, it is, yeah. Oh, mate, congratulations. So let's, we, <clears> look, we, we've got to, uh, we've got to, let's, let's get into your, your album, Kind. Mm. Um, first off, what a cover. And, yeah. and it, it caught my eye straight away. And then you, you dropped the bombshell on me. And yeah. I don't think the chairman of Parlophone, should we, should we let them know? Well, they know it? now. They know now. They've got a credit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my oldest um, drew that in a... Um, chemistry exam and um, bored at the end of the exam and did a drawing and then just Instagrammed it to me or, or, or texted it to me and I really liked it and I sent it to Dan O'Man just said do you like this painting I said it really looks like it sounds like the album because what I liked about it was there was a reflection of the tree is different to what the tree actually yeah. is and I thought to me it rep- represented you know we all show one side of ourselves but underneath there's another side to us and I love the solitude of the bench and I just thought it really looked like what the record sounded like that's exactly what i thought so uh, when i saw it yeah exactly what i thought so uh, yeah it was quite cool because it, it was bootsy's birthday 15 this week so to drive past the westfield and see a big billboard of this was quite a cool situation you've yeah. named your your eldest after the most glamorous Bootsy, bass player Bootsy College, in the yeah. whole world ever yeah, <laughs> Congra- yeah. Oh, further congratulations <laughs> mate oh um, it's so good to see you yeah. so um so it feels like I've I've listened I've only had a, had a, I got the record last night I've listened to it once and so yeah. this is very yeah. genuine like you know um, yeah. there's no analysis here it's pure feeling yeah so I'm feeling that this is you're really writing from the heart here yeah. like it feels very uh, very personal not to say that your your, yeah. your your previous work wasn't personal but it feels to me like since after your first album that you know I loved so much. Mm. You, you, were, you were writing a lot through the glass of a tour bus or a hotel yeah. room, looking at other people. Yeah. This feels like it's very much you. Yeah, I mean, the second or third record particularly was my first experiences of the world and then 
and then you get a bit older and you start experiencing your own life I guess you know when you when you're 20 26 up to that point you you're always looking out because there's nothing really going on with yourself in a massive way but as you go through the stages of life um, things start happening in your own personal life and your own surroundings um, so this album particularly you know I'd, I'd stopped touring in, in September last year we finished in Brooklyn and um, you know it's an 11th album 22 years of being on the road and I didn't have any creative block or writer's block, but I just felt like I needed to just stop. I don't know what, what, what was going on, but I just didn't feel like spending 16 hours a day waiting to perform uh, over and over again was, was doing it for me. The show was loving it. I was loving it and making the records I was loving, but I just wanted to stop. And when I came home, I just stopped doing everything. Um, and around about November, once my head started clearing a bit, I was having all these songs kind of informing me how I was feeling, you know, and I was kind of alarmed in, in quietly what a lot of the songs were saying to me but it was it felt like I was at a little bit of a crossroads and I didn't really want to stop it turned out it was that I wanted to change things up and you know maybe shift things around a little bit with my own life my own lifestyle my own experiences and and just make a few I don't know adjustments maybe I don't know but the songs were kind of telling me and I didn't edit anything I just I've got the lyric books in the house and they just start from there and they end down there and there's no scribbles out they just were what they were very subconscious kind of record mm. um, I never imagined being you talking about the record I just thought it was gonna be something I would do as a, a catharsis for myself and it would just go out uh, to, for myself and I, I said that from day one I didn't think this was a commercial record or anything like that I just it was just something I was experiencing I needed to get out of me as a what like a painter or whatever um, but it turned out the songs were very moving for other people and they wanted to bring it out. So This is it. You know, when it, I think it's about honesty, isn't it? Yeah. When, you, when you cathart, you're being really honest and you're being open, mm. and especially as a songwriter, you know, you're doing something that's so public and you're yeah. kind of opening up your soul. And people really yeah. identify with that. Well, I think everybody's going through similar things in life, you know, good, bad, whatever, you know, trying, challenging, whatever. Um, but yeah, I think it is about honesty. That's kind of what puts it very vulnerable now, because then it's like there it is, and yeah, um, it's, it's very naked, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, it's very and, exposed. And, yeah. and, and it, it, yeah, it, it, I, I appreciate it. it. Might be hard to talk about. Well, it's just been it's been a kind of an interesting period of time because I, I decided to do I did twenty shows of a solo tour myself with um with a violin and a, and a female drummer and and, uh, and different musicians and I did a lot of spoken word, lots of stories and all the key songs that got me through different points in my life. Um, but making kind of humorous stories of them in between. It, so it was like half Billy Connolly and half very Tom Waits. And, and very the evening serious. with Kelly Jones. Yeah, but it was, it was a great tour. And it was, it was like um, walking a tightrope because it was so exposed every night. But it was igniting what the band of the day job is now because I learned so much from that tour, which I just finished. And this record is kind of part of that whole kind of, I guess, information that the, 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 the feel of the music was giving me, really. Everything happens for a reason, eh, yeah. Kelly? So let's get in. Um, track one, I Just Wanted the Goods. And you, yeah. and you started off with a stomper, a yeah. stomper here. You know, it, it, I love the mmms yeah. in the intro. Yeah. And, um, and, it, and, and it kind of, it, it was heartwarming to me because it reminded me, yes, they're still a rock band. And yeah. here you are, all, 21 years later, still <laughs> in an ACDC t-shirt. Yeah. Some things never well, change. Well, I like to start records the way a show starts. Uh, you know, roll up and shine and perform some cocktails. You know, you have Vegas two times, a thousand trees. But um, I just wanted the goods was a song which is I guess less of the of the exposed side of the record. It is, is the song that starts. I still like to refer to them as side one and side two. <laughs> yeah, but, me too. Um, I just wanted the goods was a painting I got given by an artist called Steve Goddard who did the album cover for Graffiti on the Train, and um, it's basically just a brown painting with two guys slogging it out like a boxer thing. And it just I just wanted the goods written in, in pen, and it was a phrase that was coined by. Um, or the boxers back in the day when they would go down like in the fourth or fifth round for the money and just to buy a diamond ring or a fur coat for their for their mall and they would just say oh, i just wanted the goods and it was a kind of cool thing so it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek song about boxing and doing something for the money rather than the love of it really. yeah, yeah yeah and of course this is something you know about you've just reminded me because you could have boxing. been a boxer i did do a bit of boxing yeah yeah, yeah. god thank god you didn't yeah thank god <laughs> i didn't I, I don't think i'd compete oh god um so, um, well, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, in, and into track two, Fly Like an Eagle. Now, I really love this. I really love this. This, this kind of, um, I mean, obviously I heard this before I heard any, any of the yeah. records, so I kind of got used yeah. to it. This really reached 
to me in this in this yeah. in a very similar way that traffic did yeah and if you remember it was traffic yeah that was the one that broke you because that was, was my yeah. plate that's great on mtv and that was yeah. the first that, that was you know yeah that was the spark yeah and this really touched me it has got it, it has got a similar feel especially the intro as traffic and, and the chord progression and, and, the, and the sound of the acoustic guitar but you're in three four waltz time here. yeah but it's a slightly different vibe as it goes along um and I guess that song was one of the main things that was kind of telling me things, you know, the, the line Dare to Reborn just came from the subconscious and um, and Fly Like an Eagle. I guess the song is is asking questions, you know, are you, do people, people tend to stick in their safe zone and they don't really take many risks to try to move on to make things a bit uncomfortable for a bit, but to grow and to learn new things. And I think that song was one of the first songs that was kind of informed me to do that. I've always tried to push my boundaries, but... There was something happening when I wrote that that was trying to tell me to kind of, you know, push a bit harder and try to do something a little more, I guess, honest. And it sounds so, and I saw, when I very first, when I very first heard it, I didn't know it was you. I, yeah. I think it was Amy Vos played it on the radio, who's such a massive fan of yours. Yeah. And I heard it and I thought, this is some American, like, country rock band yeah. that sound really like the stereophonic. Right. Like, he's got a voice that's really like Kelly. Yeah. And this is outrageous. It's so close. Yeah. It, it, it's so American in a good way. Yeah. It's like it's almost like channeling country music, but without well, yeah. being country music. Well, yeah, I've and, always wanted to make, like, um, a Nashville record. And I, I, and I asked um, George Draculius to come over um, to do the record with me because... Because the songs were written so fast and so exposed lyrically, I wanted to capture them, just all the band in a room is a performance from beginning to end. So the whole album is pretty much a live record, really. And George was in the control room being my ears in the room and I was in, in the things so we produced it together. Good God, so George did this? Yeah, we did Black it Black Crow's producer. And Tom Petty. Yeah, of and, course, and, yeah. And you know, Roy Orbison and all stuff like that. So wow. he was a guy that I, I trusted to understand what I was trying to get across, really. And isn't it weird now, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Did you not properly, like in a really big way, like everywhere else, crack America in the same way like Oasis didn't really crack no. America? Is it, or, uh, you, you, did, you know, did you not sort of crack it? No, we didn't. We, it, we, it's I weird, mean, isn't it? Just Enough Education Reform was like huge. And um, like we were headlining Glastonbury, the Pyramid Stage, headlining Slane Castle, the record sold millions and, and it was doing really well everywhere. And, and at that point, I, I, th I kind of hit, hit the wall because, the, I mean, the band had gone mental. And just before we were doing that American tour, I got kind of stopped to take a break. People said, look, take a few weeks off because this is getting a bit insane. And we never went over to America for, for at the point we probably should have on that record. Because I think if you don't do it on that first two, three records, after that you're playing catch-up, really. And V2 started imploding a little bit. That's when they had Moby and the White Stripes and uh, lots of great independent record com companies they were buying and then the money started getting a bit mental and it just kind of fell away a little bit from us really and then we never really caught back up and then the radio form has changed and it just didn't really kind of work out for us it, but, but it, we played we played like shepherd's bush empire 2000 yeah. 3000 it's very weird though i mean it makes total sense to me why oasis wouldn't crack america yeah. it makes total sense to me why the manix wouldn't crack america yeah. i mean that's but we've always had an american underbelly to our music exactly you know? and you're such a fan of americana yeah. and, and of exactly. american yeah. rock and you know like yeah. and and you and the way that you sing is very american yeah. like you know well, it's, we've always brought it's up so, a lot of soul music you yeah know, so that was our thing it's always uh, it's always dumbfounded me that yeah. it's very weird but well i'm thinking maybe this this might well, be maybe, the one yeah, who knows? This <laughs> this might be the one. You know, there's, there's several points in this record where I'm thinking this is so America friendly. Mm. But anyways, let's crack on. So track three, we've got uh, "Make Friends with the Morning." Is this yeah. is this your handbags and glad rags? This one. <laughs> um, well, "Make Friends with the Morning" was um, was a song I wrote without any guitar or any instrument. I was walking. I was in Australia when that song came, and I just sang all those words literally as they are uh, into a, into a dictaphone and. Um, I didn't have, I, I didn't know what the chords were going to be underneath it. You know, the song was informing me again about when I wake in the morning, my mind goes very, very fast. And sometimes I can't slow it down. And sometimes it just races off in all weird directions. And I guess having a creative outlet has always been the thing that's kind of kept me calm. People say about being a workaholic or running around, this, but actually doing the work makes me feel more relaxed. So yeah, that song, I think, is talking more about how much everything gets kind of, races around a bit in my head in the morning. 
I think it, this is one it's of those a gospel very, song, yeah. yeah, it's very American sounding. Yeah. It almost, it, uh, it, by the end of it, I was almost thinking this is like a mellow Leonard Skinner song. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's like, sounds very, was yeah. it, was, was Draculias doing all of these or? Well, George and I, I did all the demos for them. I mean, the demos are all on Spotify because I put the demos out uh, prior to the recording. Me and Jamie, the drummer, just did them with a the cardboard box in our studio. So all the arrangements and everything are, are exactly the same prior to the recording. George was just, you know, he's an amazing personality, he's an amazing soul, and he's got, you know, a, the biggest heart you can ever have. So just to have George there was kind of like having somebody that I could lean on because we were just trying to capture performances, really. Yeah. So there wasn't anything, the main goal of this record was not to produce the record. It was about just capturing performances. Yeah. So it, there's no production. But on that particular record, George is really low voices doing some backing vocals and all the boys in the crew and everybody was stamping feet and clapping hands and singing. Yeah. So it was a good atmosphere. And George is, you know, he's a lot of fun to be around here. Yeah, well, the performances really do come across. It comes across like we come back to that word honest. It, it feels yeah. like a very honest record. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and we, and it's... Well, it's, everything is so produced and gridded and pro-tooled, everything today, you know, it's almost like you know what's coming next. It's all to do with algorithms and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why it is even more exposed when you put it out there, because part of you thinking, does it even stand up to how today's music sounds? Not that it sounds dated or anything like that, but it's a very loose, uh, open-sounding record, you know? I, I know I wanted to make a record that was like, like Harvest or, you know, Neil Young, or you know, something that was just like... You felt like you were in the room with a band, basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, which 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 brings us interesting. You, you mentioned Harvest because um, Stitches. Yeah. Now, that reminded me of uh, Full Moon Fever by Tom yeah. Petty. Yeah. You've got that a lovely acoustic beginning, and then uh, it, it, it kind of kicks off. And there's a there's a real relatability. Yeah. Of, you know, of a, of a little bit of a struggle. Yeah. You, know, you, you mentioned like. Uh, waiting 16 hours for a show and yeah. you know, the show is great but you touched on something that that, that is um, it means a lot to me which is that it's the mental health of musicians you know people mm. always think oh you know it's so great being a pop a yeah. rock star and stuff like that people don't really yeah. think about that it's actually it can be really tough it can be really it's hard you know it's the best job in the world when you're doing the job but there's a lot of time where you're not doing the job you yeah know? there's a lot of time you're hanging about and and I guess that's the kind of curse and the blessing of being artistic or creative. And I'm sure most people will tell you who do the same sort of thing, you know, that's where it comes through. And thankfully, I got a way of channeling what I'm doing, you know. But there, there are moments where you write stuff down and you kind of go, I, I, I didn't really know I was feeling that, but I guess I'm feeling that. Mm. Um, but that's what music is supposed to be. And that's what art is supposed to be. That's what film is supposed to be. It's supposed to be about somebody's voice telling you something that you should relate to. It shouldn't just be about selling units and algorithms and writing in the right format here and there. It needs to be from the right place, you know. That's it. There's, there, and there's such a strong relatability to this track. And, and also, importantly, there's hope. It feels well, like the there's a real, thing. like, it's a, it, it reassures. I we felt are reassured. Going through, yeah, we are going through a tunnel, but I think you can just see the light at the end of it. And yeah. I think by the end, you do kind of come out the other side of it, yeah. I definitely felt, you know, I, I, I wrote down reassured yeah. was, the, was, the, was what it left And that's me why with. I like the artwork, because the artwork says the same thing to me. It's like the sunset sort of stuff, and it just the colours of it made me feel like how that sounded. So that's why they, you know, I've always related colours, particularly ACDC logo colours. <laughs> you know, when they, when they had the red logo, I always thought the album sounded warmer. When they, when they went gold in Thoughts About Rock, I thought it was a colder sounding album. So I've always related to colours. <laughs> Um, so we come to track five. We're at the halfway point now. Yeah. Hungover for you. Yeah. Another acoustic kickoff, mm. um, which is, you know, almost almost a theme. It sounds like, it very much sounds like you're cathartic with an acoustic mm. guitar. It sounds like that, you know, yeah. you're, you're at home and you're, 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 <coughs> your heart is aching. Yeah. And you're doing that classic thing where you're writing a song in order to help you get yeah. through something. Does it, does it really help you? Uh, it doesn't at the time. At the time, it's horrible, you know, because at the time you uh, you're actually going through what you're genuinely going through. You know, it was the same with maybe tomorrow if I'm away home, or you know, at the time you you're actually putting that stuff on paper. It's uh, it's kind of as real as it is, but then after you've done it, you know, it's a bit like going for a run or talking to somebody else about something. Mm. It kind of gets halved or whatever, you know. Um, it's not really the reason why I do it, but it's become what it is, do you know what I mean? But do you think that the pain makes it better? 
I think that the, I, I'm not one of those people who go around looking for pain to write it. I've been in very many positive states of mind and made great records. It's not about that. And I wouldn't say this was a, a negative state of mind. I think this was a state of mind where it was like I was asking myself questions. Mm. Um, but I do think if you actually dig that deep, I think the listener can tell between what's kind of uh, somebody using a rhyming dictionary and somebody actually telling you what's really happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you come back to, we come back to honesty again. Um, track six now. Yeah. So we are... Uh, side two. This is... We're on side two. We've just Man, flipped it over. Isn't it great how vinyl is still yep. kicking butt? Yeah. And, you know, I it get is. actually... You know, I, I'm buying more some, vinyl. I know. We've got some pink vinyl for this as well. Oh, um, yeah. oh brilliant. Guys, can you put one aside for me? We've got, we've got, we've got picture disc <laughs> and, we've got a, and we've got a cassette. Brilliant. I, I, yeah. I just got, I, sorry, we're off topic here, but I just got, I got an, an, uh, an, a double album. Well, it's, it's one of those ones where it, the, one of the halves is, um, what the second side is, uh, the fourth side is smooth yeah. by a Mongolian yeah. heavy metal band who do throat singing. Oh, called really? The Who, H-U. Check it out, man. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> it's the rocker in you will love it. Yeah. It's absolutely hilarious. But anyway, uh, back to the stereophonics. <laughs> so uh, Bust This Town, that's your current single. Yeah. And it's another stomper. And it's like yeah. you, you, you've had all of this lovely stripped down acoustic yeah. stuff happening. And then sort of, there's, a, so yeah. there's a nice dynamic to the record. We, we sort of come back up with this one. Yeah, there's a kind of country element with all of it going on. You know, there's a kind of kind of Fleetwood Mac, Dolly Parton style of playing guitar in parts, Lindsey Buck, and a lot of finger playing guitar. And in yes. this track, there's a disco beat behind all that stuff um, and, and, and some cool bass lines and stuff like that. So myself and Jim Lowe produced that one. Uh, George wasn't on this one, but we did that one uh, a, a little while back and it never kind of fitted on anywhere, but it really fitted on this record. So, And that's just about escapism, really, about two people trying to leave a very small town and, and kind of find their way um, and explore the world and break the rules along the way, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's kind of an uplifting kind of number. Well, with that in mind, I have to ask, given, you know, it's been so long since yeah. I've seen you and where we were and where you were, you know, when, when we used to knock about in the, in the late 90s. How are things back at home? You know, like... Yeah, is, good, yeah. yeah I, 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 um, I get nervous asking this of, of, of men no, our age. No, everybody's good. Is no. Oscar all right? Oscar's Your dad good. And Beryl. And they're, Beryl. Yeah, they're all good. They, My brothers are still, uh, yeah, so, yeah. They're happy and they're well. They're good, yeah. They, um, they but, kind of, um, they come up to see me and I go down when the kids are on school holidays and stuff. They're great. They're in good nick. They're 70, 73, 74 now. So. Wow. But yeah, he's still, they all still come to the gigs and stuff like that, yeah. Well, please. My old man's still doing his band. He's, he started rehearsing every Thursday with all amazing. the boys from the band. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So he he must be so proud. Yeah, like, it's been like, good. I'm almost in tears here thinking, of, as a dad well, now, for me, thinking what I, I know. he must be feeling, it's, you know. It's, um, it's a strange thing because every single time I do live radio or live TV, I'm always still waiting for his text going, yeah, it was all right, it was good. <laughs> so, <laughs> is he going to be watching yeah, this? this is... Oscar, you're an absolute legend, man. <laughs> Love you to bits. And said, please kiss Beryl for me. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, so, uh, and, but, but, you're, but of course, you're not living in Kamama now. You're, you're, no, I've got, you're, I've, I've, I built a house there back in the late 90s. So I, my mum and dad look after the garden and all that stuff because my mum was working in the factories. And so they love just keeping their hands busy doing yeah. stuff. So, th I mean, when I moved out to London and I had some children in London, they go to school there. We go back down when we can. But they just love doing bits and pieces over there, keeps them busy, you know what I mean? And you still like go to your local and get have, have all your well, old the Ivy Bush and all that's closed down. I still go down the Workman's Club <laughs> when I can. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, all right, so we come to track seven now. So um, this life ain't easy. Now this is uh, wow. This is I really love this. This this reached into me as well. Uh, is this the long one? Um, yeah. It, this it, this is a blues. This is a blues song. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, Ah, oh, this is going to be hard, and it's going to be hard for me to not cry actually thinking about this. But in, and especially now looking at you, I, I, mm. I and listening to this record, I remind it reminded me of Stu. Yeah, I, I thought of Stu a lot. Yeah, and uh, you know you must you must miss him terribly. It's um, it, it's a major thing, and like I said when I did that that tour, it was a, it was an opportunity to talk about some of that stuff and talk about the funny stories, and you know because the size of his character was huge. <laughs> And as everybody's ever met him, he was very loud. <laughs> um, but he was an incredible guy. And I guess the, the 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 birth of that song, I was talking to some old friends in New York. There was somebody retiring in a radio station. I had to do like a, a video to send to them. We were talking on the phone. It just took me back to a lot of the times when I first met. And 
she would tell me about, you should watch this TV show, The Sopranos, and, and you should listen to this record. And it was the first time somebody was actually giving me things in a, in a foreign land like New York, and I was so influenced by what was going on. And, and it took me back, and I, I guess the opening line, you know, uh, old friends grow old and some don't make it at all. Obviously, that touches on, on Stuart. And then there's a lot of um, contrast between how things were when we had no responsibility to how things are when you have all the responsibility. And when you're younger, you, you, you're very um, in, free in exploring and experimenting, doing whatever you want to do. But then there's a point where you kind of, you're being pulled all over the place. And um, I guess the song's about that in some ways, but this life ain't easy, but it's the one that we all got is, is the key to the song really, because that just came out. And then it's not about somebody moaning and groaning about their life. It's literally like, look, whatever's going on, this is where you're at, and you're gonna have to just deal with it because you've only got one life. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, so that so that tagline is kind of integral to the. It's not poor me, this, that, and the other. It's actually, again, it's about hope and about looking forward to like, you know, whatever you're going through, it'll it'll get better in some ways, or or you'll sort something out, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. It did give me a profound sense of the wheel turning. Yeah. This song, and. Um, but I did, it, it again left me feeling, well, I am a very glass half full person, as yeah. you know, but it, it, it made me think, you know, looking, like you say, it's not woe is me. And, and your life actually must be yeah. much easier and, and happier now than, than when we were knocking about in the late 90s. Well, it was a lot simpler in the 90s. You know, it's a bit like the old Chris Robinson thing. You know, you leave house when you're 22, one bag, and then before you know it, you're walking around with a lot more bags on your shoulder. You know? so there's, a, it's, it's, uh, there's one way of looking yeah, at it. So, there's a lot of baggage that comes with life as well. Yeah. So, um, but no, I'm I'm in a very f um, privileged and fortunate position with my family, particularly. You know, I love being a dad, and I love having my kids, and uh, and and the family's important. And I'm lucky to be in a band that we all like each other, and doing what we're doing, and still being top of our game. And there's 15 year old kids coming into the shows and in the front row who just discovering the band on like Sailor V or something two albums ago and then going back and realizing oh you've got nine other albums and that's, so that's it's, heartwarming so it's amazing rather you know. like, uh, like become, Gallagher's getting really young you know yeah. his fans are getting younger you know exactly, that's really yeah. cool it's like when you go to an ACDC or a Stones gig it's like generation thing going on so it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of cool you know yeah yeah god I love you know like, well, I, I, I'm, I'm mates with a prodigy and I love seeing yeah. prodigy gigs for that reason yeah, you'll see exactly, three, yeah. you'll sometimes see you see the family yeah. you see like a granddad a dad yeah. and his yeah, you know exactly. And you'll see them standing next to each other. We've done a lot of gigs like... with the Prodigy back in the day, yeah. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, yeah, that was a very, very moving. And it's, it's, it's sort of like there's a nice flow to the record. And this gem yeah. at, where is it, track seven, it's a, it's a, it's a profound sort of place yeah. for it to be. Yeah, you know, lucky yeah. number, and it's yeah. like right in the meat of the record. Um, so then we come to, oh, what a lovely name, track eight, Street of Orange Light. yeah. Um, well, when we were growing up, streetlights are not that colour anymore, but they used to be all orange in, in the terraced streets in, in Wales. Yeah. And, and probably most of all working class towns, I guess. But um, the, I had a little picture my mother gave me. She found up the attic. There was an old uh, artist that lived in um, Kamama called John Jenkins, and he used to do pen and ink drawings of all like the local spots, like the church or the, or the club or the school. And then he'd put 12 of them together and sell little calendars and stuff. And I used to love these drawings. I used to copy them when I was a kid. Anyway, she had one left, which was my old school, my old nursery school. And I was looking at it, and it just made me realise that my first ever memory was in that doorway of that school. My mother left me when she was like, when I was about three and a half, and she went off to the factory. And I remember being upset when she left. And then I remember I actually had my first kiss in the same doorway. <laughs> and I couldn't actually reach over to hug this girl because... I'd fallen off a wall two weeks before, waiting for it to come out of the house, and landed on a on a milk bottle and slipped my wrist. So I had a plaster cast on, <laughs> and I just remember all these little things happening. And then I remember my brother Kevin used to put me in a sleeping bag and put us on the doorstep, and we used to watch the rain, um, uh, just going through those orange lights in the street. And very calm, um, sort of comforting moments. My brother, my other brother Lee, with a with a pool cue changing the channel and our black and white telly in our bedroom. <laughs> And just all these things came out. You. Yeah, I was a Terry Griffiths snooker kid. My old man won in a raffle. <laughs> you know, so all these things kind of came out in this song. So I guess it's a kind of postcard back to that village, I guess, and my youth growing yeah. up in that. In and some sense. It, 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 like I say, the flow to the record is really, really, um, it, it, it's moving because like this life ain't easy is is so wistful and kind of 
contemplative and backward looking in a, in a very romantic way. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a downer, but in a good way. But yeah. then, and then you get Street of Orange Light, which musically starts in such yeah, an quite, optimistic way. It's quite pretty, It's yeah. really well, like heart-lifting. Yeah, you know? it is. It's like nylon string and finger picking. It's a, it's a pig to play, but it was a lovely kind of piece of music, that I think. Yeah, it's such a, it's a, it's such a, it's such a nice dynamic. The, the record feels like it's, it flows really. Yeah. Did well, you like think album. about it a lot? About I did, the... I did. And I didn't give the record company single tracks. If they wanted to listen to it, they had to listen to it 42 minutes mm. in one stretch because I'm not that I'm a, a purist, but I think this particular album, I think you'd understand it more if you listen to it in its duration because they started doing these little 15 second clips on Instagram of a certain song. And I was going, this is not going to work in that way. This needs to be, you need to be in, involved in the whole experience of the record really for, to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, it, 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 the, and there's a slightly different vibe to this. Mm. Um, I'm not sure what it is, whether it's, just, I don't know, the, 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 the no, I'm not sure what it is, but it, it sounded like almost REM-like. Which there was the, the street, the, yeah, yeah, Street of Orange, like, right. it, like, it, like it, it, maybe a touch of Nick Drake in the the way mm. that the guitar sounded. Yeah. Like, I think it was the sound. I think it was the, yeah. the guitar sound was just different from all of your other. Well, it's very sounds. yeah, it's a nylon string, and and I'm not, uh, you know, not brilliant at doing it. And what I like about the record is it does sound like a guy just picked up the guitar and he's he's having a go of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not it's not produced or polished in any way, and it's very it's very there, and it's um. It's a song I was knocking about with for a long time, just playing on it, but I never had any uh, uh, vocal to it. But felt like a breath of fresh air. And maybe yeah. it's made the nylon strings. It just made, and that's why well, I always like those. Great. I've always liked that kind of John Williams Deer Hunter vibe and all those types of pieces of music, you know. Um, so I don't know. There's a lot of things coming through on that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are uh, we're in the home straight now, mm. um, at track number nine, and don't let the devil take another day. Yeah. Um, this. This reminded me of your early work, actually. Yeah. Um, it, of course, more polished, you know, a bit less raw, like mm. more American sounding. Yeah. But it, it really made me think, you know, oh, you know. Yeah, well, it's a song that there. sounds like you've, um, it's a song you sound, sounds like you've heard it before. It sounds like a, like a, like a standard in some ways, you know. Um, and I've had that song for a while I've recorded it three or four times and never quite got it how I wanted it to do it. So this is literally the last recording the band did. We did it about, you know, one o'clock in the morning, just knocked it out and we loved the vibe of what it was. Um, and that was the name of that tour I did, Don't Let the Devil Take Another Day, which is basically about, you know, we all got stuff coming in and out of whatever's going on, but tried to kind of, um, it was inspired by a, um, a Chris Christopherson song, Help Me Make It Through the Night, where he says, let the devil take tomorrow for tonight, I need a friend. Oh yeah. And I guess the devil represents the bad times and, and you know, you're trying to get through to the, and it starts off with, with an imagery of a guy in the car and he's at the traffic lights and he didn't look and he's crashed his car and then he gets out and sees the airplane wondering where they're going and then he goes off on his journey. So, yeah. but that was that kind of bit more of a narrative. And it's such, an, it's such an Americana title, isn't it? Yeah, it's very kind of, yeah, it's all a James Bond's film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well actually, yeah. no, I didn't think, I just, I, yeah, that, it, it felt more, Georgia, it yeah. more more Tennessee, you know. Yeah. Than, well, uh, I've always loved that kind of Otis Redding kind of mixed with Tom Petty, mixed with Dylan. You know, it's all that kind of Creedence Clearwater Revival. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you mentioned Dylan, um, and that is apt because uh, track number ten, Enter the Harmonica, oh, for yeah. the first time yeah. on the record, and it's very hard to mm. uh, hear a harmonica and acoustic guitar and not think of, of Bob course. Dylan. Yeah. And here we sit, not minutes after you've done Subterranean Homesick Blues <laughs> on the Chris Evans Breakfast Show. Yeah. So, there, you know, there must be a resonance. That, that, yeah, that, that, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I had two older brothers and they were, I, was, you know, I was brought up with their record collection, really. So Dylan was a big part of that. Neil Young particularly was a big part of that. And Crosby still was Nash and Young and stuff. So I, um, the, the, the funny story with our harmonica is we'd recorded the song and it's a very kind of, uh, again, a, you know, a song about trying to be a bit easier on your own stuff. You, you're taking care of everybody else, but try to give yourself a break. That's the song sentiment, really, about the restless mind going back to the make friends with the morning kind of song. And um, I took my little three and a half year old to the studio and she found this harmonica and she was bouncing around the floor and she was blowing and sucking into it. I thought she actually sounds probably as good as D D Dylan. <laughs> and I thought, is it that easy? And, and then I just had a go of it and I said to Jim, I said, press record, I'm going to overdub an harmonica on this. And, and that's what it was. 
<laughs> you made so, it sound like a, like a drunk person breathing yeah, but, through a harmonica outside pretty, the tube station. It was pretty straightforward, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I say it, start, you know, it starts off like Bob Dylan, but then suddenly mm. backing vocals happen. And yeah. then suddenly I'm in somewhere completely different. Yeah. And, I, I, and it may surprise you, I don't know how you feel about this, but I suddenly got transported to a spaghetti western. Yeah, That's it's what, like a Coen Brothers movie. It was, yeah, like a Coen Brothers doing a, doing yeah. a, doing a sort of a homage to yeah. spaghetti. And I suddenly was in this, well, you say Coen Brothers. I was in Sergio Leone yeah. territory, you know, and that's one of my favorite places to be. You know, yeah. I love a spaghetti western. Yeah, it's a very different thing there. I mean, it's very, I don't know what era that is, that, but, but me and Adam went in the vocal booth to do that. And that was me and him just messing about at first. And I, and I, I, I really liked what he was actually doing to the song. It, it was very simplistic, but it was kind of... Um, I don't know, you can kind of see these young young men with like side partings with brittle cream or something doing those backing <laughs> vocals. It's a very odd thing. Well, they all had they all had cowboy hats in yeah. my in, in my world <laughs> when I was listening to this. It's so dusty ones, yeah. real ones, you yeah. know. Not not you know, no messing around here. It's so western. And I, I loved this song. It's a lovely way it it felt like a really lovely musical place to leave us yeah. at the end of the record. And it felt I had this very romantic feeling that you were riding into this sunset, yeah. into this big, huge sunset. Into and I'm in here, yeah. and this is what I see, you know, but this is so much more kind of yeah. intimate than that. Yeah. But what, what, what this made me feel was you're riding into the sunset and there was a real sense of finality about it. And I, yeah. it made me worried slightly that I was thinking, God, has Kelly had enough? Like, is this, <laughs> is this it? Like, you know, is, is, am I going to yeah. see Kelly's going to tell me that the band are going to split up or something? But then, but then, now, now I'm I'm looking at I'm, yeah. I listen to you on the Chris Evans show and I'm and I'm getting your vibe now and it. I'm thinking that you are riding into the sunset but just before the screen goes black you're turning around and giving us a cheeky little wink. yeah there's a lot more going on and it's it's a great you know the, uh, that's where the album title comes from not so kind to my restless mind I thought the word kind is um it's got so many different meanings you know different kinds of people we all hang with and. You know different kinds of music you've been kind to obviously you've been kind to yourself whatever and it was just a word that kind of to me summed up the whole the whole message within the record um and it is you know it does finish off in that kind of way and i think it is hopeful and i think that record has has really helped me understand quite a lot of things that i've been going through um whether i'll make a record like that again i don't know but it for the time that it is now that it, it makes sense to where i'm at you know so how do you feel now, having having gone, th having, you know, you've gone through it, you've written it, you've yeah. you've, you've produced it, you, you're 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 releasing it today, mm. and you've sat with me that you haven't seen for nearly twenty years, and you've talked yeah. about it. It's Has a it bit strange to be honest, because it, you know, I was relieved in one sense it was out today because part of me is just like, oh, just get out there because all this teasing stuff is kind of it's weird, um, and I just want people to just spend some time with it. If they get it, they get it. If they don't, they don't get it. But for me, it, it, it was what it was, and it is what it is, you know. Um, and to talk about it, it's a, it's a little bit strange because I think, ultimately, I think you need to be in it to understand it or feel it. Because I think, as you said earlier, and when I was mixing it with Al Clay, who actually mixed performance of Cocktails and Anthony in for 16 years either. Oh, and wow. I called, and I called Al back because I knew the record was very sentimental and... and uh, almost gentle in its lyric, but I wanted the band to sound masculine. And I knew Al would do a great job with just four musicians because we didn't overdub it too much. So, And, that, and that, that's the kind of sentiment behind the whole thing, really, is to just kind of bring a lot of people that you felt warm with and at, at ease with and put something out there that's real. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, real it definitely is. I hope people do get into it, and I really hope it makes people feel. Good, me and too. I really hope we don't leave it another 21 years, because well, I, I probably I, won't even make it 21 well, years. Well, who will? <laughs> yeah. Kelly Jones, lovely, Thank absolutely you, lovely to see you again. You, Thank you for lovely taking us through this very uh, honest and moving record. Thank you, Eddie. The Chris Evans Breakfast Show and the best music. Virgin Radio.